Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So maybe your tomatoes didn't quite do their thing this year or your beets were a little spotty, literally and figuratively, I suppose. We're going to try to go through some common soil issues and some of what you can do to identify and then fix them. So let's do it. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover every issue soil can have, but I am likely going to knock out like 80% of them with this first issue that absolutely plagues gardens and soils, that is compaction. My goodness, few things will limit your production more than compacted soil, unless you're trying to produce diseases and pests, and I suppose in which case, carry on. Uh, and compaction can happen in any soil type, though it is often more common in clay than sand because clay particles are so darn small and they smash together really well as evidenced by, well, pottery. Compaction limits production in a variety of ways. First, it restricts water movement. So in wetter times, the water lingers and pools up below, but also sometimes on top of uh, the surface, which disease causing organisms absolutely appreciate. Plant roots, not so much. In drier times, the water struggles to penetrate, meaning the plants don't have access to just, you know, an essential component of photosynthesis. Air movement is also a big issue with compaction. Plant roots and microbes need air, including both oxygen and nitrogen. Uh, soil dwelling microbes also need to be able to respire. That is to breathe out carbon dioxide, just like us, only tinier. That CO2 drifts up from the soil and plants recapture it in their leaves and then use it to create plant parts and roots and sugary snacks called exudates that they leak out through their roots. Um, if those things can't happen, the plants won't grow and the microbes won't thrive, all of those things. Of course, anaerobic organisms, that is organisms that live and love low oxygen environments, really appreciate compacted soils. Those organisms often get a bad rep, but they are not all bad. Some anaerobes are a huge part of the nitrogen fixation cycle, for instance. But a lot of pathogenic organisms, the diseasey ones, because diseasey is probably a word, love that anaerobic environment provided by poor air and water movement. And of course, roots and organisms are going to have a harder time moving through compacted soil. So how do you identify compaction? Well, there are two main types of compaction, surface compaction and deep compaction. Both of these forms of compaction come from things like an over-reliance on tillage or working the soil when it's too wet heavy equipment or livestock concentrations, and or simply a lack of organic matter, mulches and plants and those sorts of things. So just not great agricultural practices in a nutshell. Surface compaction is usually pretty visible. It looks and feels hard or crusted. Uh, even weeds struggle to grow in, in surface compacted soil. Uh, surface compaction can be addressed by lightly working it with a hoe or a machine or some other implement and then adding a mulch layer to protect it Alternatively, when no mulches are available, an inch or so of compost lightly worked into the top inch or so of soil will help keep the soil from crusting. Um, deep compaction can come from those same things, but deep compaction is a little harder to identify and address. Like everything, they make fancy tools for identifying compaction that you don't really need. This one is a $200 penetrometer that I use as a prop in videos where I tell people that they don't need it. It's what it's good for. Now, Obviously, if you're a researcher, a penetrometer is going to come in really handy. If you're just a farmer, a piece of rebar will come in really handy. Uh, it will tell you a lot about where your compaction is and how deep. Simply press the rebar into the soil when it's reasonably moist, but not very wet or very dry. And you may need somebody kind of strong to do it. Uh, but wherever that rebar stops, that's where your compaction layer begins. If it's eight or so inches down, I recommend to just follow generally good soil practices like those outlined in the Living Soil Handbook, which when you buy it from notillgrowers.com, the proceeds go to making more videos like this. Yep, following those practices will eventually help correct your compaction issues. If the rebar stops just a few inches down, however, then your compaction is in the root zone and that's going to be an issue for a while. That sort of four to eight inch zone is the rhizosphere and it is really important for nutrient gathering and for microbial life. So the two best ways to decompact that zone is to apply an inch to several inches of compost to a bed, um, then broad fork that bed surface lightly to allow that compost to fall into the cracks. Next, you just want to keep that bed planted as much as you possibly can. I like mixing in cover crops where I can, but watch our cover crop videos before 
just throwing any old cover crop out there. Um, cover crops are excellent at helping to decompact soil, but they are also excellent at becoming weeds. So, you know, be smart about it. Use that broad fork only as long as your compaction issue remains. After that, it's not necessary. Um, for some denser soils, that may be years. For looser, sandier soils, it may only take a single season of broad forking. On a larger scale, you can use like a subsoiler instead of a broad fork uh, to work compost into the crevices. Um, there is more to say on compaction, but you know, there are other things that can go wrong in the soil. So let's tackle a few of those real quick. A big one which can be caused by compaction, but can also be created, caused by high water tables and other things, is poor drainage. We've already been over the fact that plants hate sitting in standing water, and if we haven't, they hate sitting in standing water. There's a reason every seed packet says prefers well-draining soil. But admittedly, that's a little amusing to me. I mean, why that one trait? Like, why doesn't it also say prefers not to be on fire, or prefers not to be suffocated or smashed by beavers? That's what my tag reads. I think. If the rain won't drain, your crop will likely suffer. Ideally, you find this out before you start your gardens with a percolation test in which you fill a hole with water in the growing season, allow the water to drain out, then refill that hole and see how long it takes to drain. If it takes more than 24 hours, that's not great. That means you likely have a drainage issue which will need to be addressed. If it's a light drainage issue, like it drained in 12 hours, uh, raising your beds and pointing them lightly downhill will help relieve some of that water in excessive times. If it's a severe drainage issue, you may need to consider a drainage tile or ditches or French drains to divert water or some other form of earth movement. Um, instructing you on how exactly to do that is perhaps beyond the scope of this video and my own personal expertise. You're welcome. Uh, it will depend on your budget soil conditions, slope, and a million other things. Consult with folks who do construction or foundation repairs if it's something that must be addressed. In severe cases where drainage cannot be added, you may simply have to build beds raised more than 10 inches um, above the surface or find a different place to garden. I know that's not great news, sorry. Now for some, drainage may be less of an issue in terms of the soil holding too much water. Instead, one major garden issue is that the soil is simply not holding water at all. Poor water retention can be a product of compaction or sandier soils, which can drain quickly, but it can also be a product of low soil organic matter. Soil organic matter is an incredible, somewhat enigmatic substance, allowing excess water to escape the soil in heavy rain events while also holding on to water in drier times. A simple soil test will give you an indication of your soil organic matter, but note that some farms, especially those with reasonable moisture levels and decent soil, can operate just fine with lower organic matter levels. So two to three percent soil organic matter on one farm may be fine, but on another farm, especially perhaps quickly draining sandy soils or something, may not be good enough. The good news is that increasing soil organic matter is one of the hardest things to do as a farmer. Still gotta look up what that means, good news. I know this is the no-till channel, but if you're about to start a garden and your soil test is telling you that the soil organic matter is low, now is your time to work in a bunch of nice compost and increase the water and nutrient holding capacity of that soil like right away before you even start planting anything. Um, indeed, I'm suggesting a one-time tillage to inject compost and possibly other amendments like biochar and or rock minerals as per the recommendation of an agronomist in the very beginning of a garden so you don't have to do it a year or so down the road when your soil is still low in soil organic matter and nothing you want to grow is growing, but you don't really want to have to redo your entire garden. In fact, get your garden set up well in the beginning if you can, and you should never need to till it again. Think of it not like doing damage to the native soil, but rather laying the foundation for never having to damage the soil again. Watch the video I did on starting gardens for more insight into garden starting. Uh, if you're dealing with an established garden, mulches have been shown to help grow organic matter and consistently keeping the beds planted will also contribute to that. There is nothing better for soil than living plants. That's why there are so many living plants out there. If you can add a cover crop in the rotation, even better. And remember, frequent tillage events, especially at high speeds, can break up soil aggregates and whip in oxygen. Uh, then oxygen-loving bacteria go bonkers and consume that newly freed up organic matter. So you just lose it. Effectively, once you have your gardens in place, do as little of that soil turnover as humanly possible, especially around the rhizosphere. Uh, soil organic matter will slowly increase and stabilize as long as you are keeping the soil planted, 
covered and undisturbed as much as possible. Perhaps, obviously, nutrient deficiencies can be an issue in soils, but often those are less the cause of a certain nutrient not being in that soil, as much as the soil being one of the two above issues that I already mentioned, like poorly draining or compacted soils, or it can be the product of another nutrient in excess, like maybe you have way too much phosphorus and that's locking something else up. There are agronomists who also contend that it's a lack of, a, of specific soil microbes, or the proper quantity of soil microbes to essentially unlock certain nutrients. Uh, my suggestion, if you are seeing nutrient deficiencies, is start by addressing compaction and drainage and water retention. Then, if those don't work, consult with an agronomist who is not only familiar with organic production, but preferably ecological growing methods as well. There are a lot of them out there. Uh, just give them a call and chat with them and see if they're cool and nerdy. That's always that's just my test for everything. Are you a nerd? Let's go. If the issue persists, or if you're in the middle of the season and you're like, thanks for nothing here, Farmer Jesse, research the deficiencies you are seeing, and there are organic nutrient foliar sprays available um, out there that for basically any deficiency, and foliar sprays tend to be faster acting than most soil amendments, at, you know, anything you're adding to the soil, like rock minerals and etc. So indeed, foliar sprays can be a temporary but effective remedy, but you still do have to address the compaction, etc. I've gone over the major issues, but some quick hitters here real quick that can also really hamper soil. Uh, previous land use, if the people who were there before you applied a lot of herbicides or used a lot of tillage or concentrated livestock. Um, for us, it was giant horses. Fun. Anyway, there may be a range of issues for you to combat that started long before you got there. Using bad compost can cause lots of problems from herbicide contamination to nutrient excesses to nutrient tie-up in, in the case of composts being too woody and worked into the soil. Uh, maybe you applied a deep layer of mulch and are having poor production. Not all mulches make sense in all contexts. Watch the mulch video for more info on that, but if you're trying to grow warm weather crops in a cold region and you're using, say, hay or straw, that can keep the soil very cool. Soil pH. Uh, that's obviously something else that can be a detriment to gardens and soils. Uh, and in certain cases, you will have to address the pH with nutrient applications under the guidance of an agronomist. pH can really cause problems in a garden, but I did not put that one up higher on the list. Because similarly to nutrient deficiencies, if you are doing everything else I have suggested in this video, the pH should slowly balance out. Indeed, the primary causes of pH change are things like a loss of organic matter, or erosion, or leaching from rain, and so on. Does that sound familiar? In other words, addressing other issues we've talked about indirectly also addresses the pH issue. So you can correct pH with rock minerals, and in depleted soils you may have to, along with adding some organic matter like compost, but generally you just treat the soil well, which will help keep the pH in check. Weeds are also another one, but weeds are generally good from a soil's perspective, they, they don't plague the soil as much as they plague the gardener. But weeds are a product of a few different things. One, working the soil too deep. Two, allowing weeds to go to seed. Three, not covering with mulches or growing plants. Four, poorly timed cultivations. Cultivations, especially in the early part of a garden, should be early and often to reduce weed seed banks. Five, weeds can come from poorly managed compost. I'm sure someone in the comment section has a horror story if you're in need of one. And six, because like I always say, weeds are the emergency solar panels that the soil throws up when you aren't doing your job. So you can kind of think of weeds like the soil being passive aggressive, which makes me laugh a little bit. Anyway, let us know what has plagued your soil or issues that you've seen that you don't can't explain. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook uh, at notillgrowers.com specifically, or a hat, or other merch. Uh, join our Patreon page at patreon.com slash notillgrowers, or just hit that super thanks button that works too. All of that helps make these videos. Like this video if you like this video. If you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button, and if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. I personally just hope that um, this helps people's tomatoes catch up next year. Where are you going?